as I said, he joined us in 1991. Primary responsibility is, of course, trying to keep us in line. That keeps him reasonably busy. Um, he is, was trained as a clinical psychologist at the University of Hawaii, somehow ended up in St. Louis. Uh, spent a year studying, uh, a postdoctoral year studying clinical neuropsychology and behavioral medicine at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. And then later completed two years of postdoctoral training working as a health policy fellow and science policy fellow for the U.S. Congress. And the first year spent working on the po personal staff of Senator Tom Daschle, and the second year was spent working for the Government Operations Committee in the House of Representatives. Next month, uh, he's going to be recognized with the Ernest R. R. Hilgard Award for outstanding lifetime contributions to general psychology across specialty areas. And with that, Danny, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. And I'm pleased to be here, and I'm especially pleased to have some of my colleagues in the audience, and, and uh, I'll try to make this interesting and relevant. I, um, I am very, really fascinated by the, the, the history of the treatment of people with mental illness, and I've become more interested in the subject since coming to uh, MIMH some 16 years ago. And it's not always a proud history, uh, but it's uh, continually a fascinating history. And so I think that this is a very appropriate topic for continuing education. Uh, educating mental health providers in the state of Missouri and in fact around the nation and especially in the Midwest is part of the mission of MIMH and it's part of our mission that we take very seriously and uh, I'm, I just really appreciate the job that our CE division has been doing with our continuing education program. Um, I edit a journal called Psych Critiques and we try to evaluate the most important books that come out in the field of psychology and uh, we've gotten three books recently that I found especially interesting. One was called The Architecture of Madness and it involves uh, looking at insane asylums, psychiatric hospitals around the United States and uh, this is really fascinating. These books are available through the MIMH library and uh, uh, Christina Sullivan will help you get uh, one of these books if they appear interesting and relevant and you would like to read it. Um, another book that came out recently um, grew out of the fact that they were shutting down Willard State Hospital in upstate New York and they found upstairs uh, in the attic a number of uh, suitcases. And, and the suitcases were full of personal memorabilia of patients who had lived and died at this hospital. Uh, this is a woman who was uh, there for 43 years. And uh, oftentimes they, they, they lived in very small and very austere rooms. And um, it is really fascinating to, to read these personal stories. And <clears throat> most recently there was a book that I was particularly excited about called Evolution of a Missouri asylum and it's about the history of Fulton State Hospital and it's one of the most fascinating books that I've read in a, uh, a year or so and I want to encourage you to, uh, to read this uh, if you care about these issues at all. Uh, as all of you know Keith Schaefer is the director of the Department of Mental Health and I was able to get Keith to write a review for the journal I edit and uh, this, uh, what is really fascinating about this is Keith, in his review, points out that the problems that people were dealing with in the, uh, the 19th century are, are almost identical to the problems that he deals with on a daily basis in the 21st century. And uh, they, they revolve around a lack of resources to provide the treatment that we would like to provide for people with mental illness in Missouri. So if you don't have time to read the book, you might at least want to read uh, Keith Schaefer's uh, review of it. And uh, if anybody is interested in <coughs> any of the material that I allude to in my talk, uh, you can drop CE an email and I'll be glad to uh, get you copies of Keith's review or, or other information. Uh, this is a picture of Michael Caine. Do you recognize the film? And what is it? Quills. Quills. And uh, it, it, it's a, uh, a very uh, negative portrayal of how people were treated uh, in the 17th century. Uh, and Michael Caine is, the, is a psychiatrist who directs an institution. And, and people really are treated very inhumanely and very cruelly. And that wasn't always the case, but uh, it was often the case. If we go back, back far enough, 
uh, we find instances of trepanation. Is that a word that's familiar to you? Some of you? Um, it, it involved uh, cutting a hole in the skull and um, presumably these were people who were mentally ill and, and we know that mental illness is found across cultures and diseases like schizophrenia are found around the world and, and we suspect that people with those diseases, with coping with those problems uh, uh, millennia ago when there weren't effective treatments that people tried to use uh, surgical techniques to help these individuals and uh, the presumption was that the person was possessed, most often possessed by demons or the devil. And what's interesting is that we know that um, some of the people lived after the operation. And you can see where the, uh, the trepanation occurred, but the skull continued to grow. And so we assume this was a fairly young person who had the procedure, and yet he lived afterwards, and uh, the skull grew back uh, and partially covered the hole. And uh, one of the fascinating things for me as a neuropsychologist is that trepanation um, was in the majority of cases performed in the right frontal area. And why would that be important? What's significant about the right frontal area of the brain? Any guesses? Well, you know, we, we know that language is in the left hemisphere. And so if they, the, the procedure had been done uh, probably neural tissue would be compromised or, or destroyed and, and people would be aphasic after the operation. So these early neurosurgeons knew enough to, uh, to, to, to operate on the right side of the brain and if they'd gone very far back they would have hit the uh, parietal uh, lobe and the sensory strip and the motor strip so people would be paralyzed and so and then if they went all the way back to the occipital lobe people would lose visual function and so the uh, the right frontal area of the brain is sometimes called a silent area it, it really is very important but but it doesn't affect motor functions or sensory functions or language and so it really was the best possible place to uh, to do the operation we don't have time to talk about all of the political figures and rulers who were probably mentally ill, but Caligula is perhaps the best example uh, based on his symptoms. Today we would probably diagnose him as a person with schizophrenia, uh, but he also had epilepsy, so it was compounded and we're not quite sure what his diagnosis would be today. Uh, but he was, he was clearly mentally ill. Uh, he had incestuous relationships with three of his sisters. He declared his horse uh, a Roman senator, and he declared himself a god. Uh, how many of you know who the patron saint of mental illness is? Tom, who is it? St. Uh, Dimpha. St. Dimpha. And uh, Tom's a good Catholic boy, and so he knows things like that. And the rest of you who are Catholics and don't should. Uh, but uh, St. Dimpha uh, was murdered by her father, actually. And uh, he, he was uh, a, uh, a ruler in what is today Belgium. His wife died. Uh, he he uh, was obsessed with his grief. He insisted that his daughter uh, replace his wife and, and marry him and become the queen. Uh, she fled from uh, the palace, and uh, he eventually caught up with her. Uh, again demanded that she marry him, she refused, and she was beheaded. And this happened in a little town in Belgium called Giel. And uh, Giel became a haven for people with mental illness. And it turned out that many of the people who came to, uh, to Giel turned out to be good workers. And so even today the town takes pride in, in <coughs> uh, opening its arms to people with mental illness. Uh, George Hewlett, a few years ago, replicated this. George is the former director of the uh, Department of Mental Health and the Missouri Institute of Psychiatry, and George set up a similar program in New Haven, a small community uh, not too far from St. Louis, and he took patients from the hospital and put them in Giel, and it was a depressed area, and people needed the money, so instead of paying hospital bills, he paid families to take in people with mental illness, and, and that project worked really well and eventually was shut down because of budgetary limitations, but it really was a success and something we take great pride in. Here you see a painting by uh, Hieronymus Bosch, 
called the extraction of the stone of madness and you can see an early neurosurgical procedure. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar is important because it's the first biblical example of mental illness and you might remember that Nebuchadnezzar was a king who uh, uh, became uh, insane, he went out, he lived in the fields, he ate grass, but eventually uh, recovered. I'm uh, very interested in the way that uh, mental illness was portrayed in the medieval period and, and of course oftentimes there was the presumption that the devil was involved and you will see the devil entering people's bodies most often through the mouth but the nev devil is, is always of course up to no good and here he's trying to get these two young people uh, to misbehave as devils do. Um, Hippocrates uh, developed this idea that we have uh, four humors and that the kind of, of diseases that people get depends on their personality and your personality depends on the balance of these uh, four humors, blood and black bile and yellow bile and phlegm and uh, different <coughs> uh, levels of those humors resulted in melancholic uh, individuals, sanguine individuals, choleric individuals and phlegmatic individuals. And Carl Jung was actually uh, very influenced by this model in developing his uh, techniques and methods and theories. Um, this is a quote from a book that was published uh, many, many years ago called Discourses Concerning the Soul of Brutes. And of course the reference was to people with mental illness. Uh, it was in the 17th century when it was published and um, you can get a sense for uh, what the book is about by some of the quotations and they talk about how people with mental illness are wild animals that must be dominated and broken by the physician and they recommend bleeding, purges, uh, near drowning, something like waterboarding one suspects and, uh, and the bath of surprise and so uh, these uh, ideas really persisted uh, well through the 18th century. This is a Hogarth painting illustrating a Bedlam hospital and, and where does the word Bedlam come from? It was St. Mary's of, of Bethlehem and uh, in, in popular usage in London it came to be called Bedlam and uh, it, it was, uh, it's been around since the 13th century uh, and, and people would pay to come in and be amused by the annex of the patients. And, and this has, has persisted for a long time. When I was a graduate student in clinical psychology, we took tours of the hospital and the patients were pointed out and described to us. And I'm proud of the fact that we're beyond that now and we don't put patients on display the way we did in, in the 70s. And I think that, that patients in psychiatric hospitals have a right to privacy and dignity and uh, they shouldn't be put on display the way they were at Bedlam. Uh, and this is a quotation pointing out that it was useful to take your children to Bedlam because it would be an effective deterrent against any wayward inclinations. And I've had at least a hundred people tell me that when they were being raised in St. Louis, they were told, if you don't behave, I'll take you to Arsenal Street, 5400 Arsenal, our hospital. And uh, it, it, it probably isn't a, a very good thing to tell your children. Uh, <coughs> This is Rene Descartes who said, I think, therefore I am. And uh, Descartes is important in the history of mental illness because he was primarily responsible for this idea of, of dualism, that we have a body and we have a mind and that they, they, they sort of exist on parallel tracks. And sometimes the mind affects the body and sometimes the body affects the mind and they, they intersect occasionally, but by and large, they are two separate entities. And of course, if you have bodies and minds, you need specialists in bodies, and those are physicians, and you need specialists in minds, and those are psychiatrists and psychologists. And, and the fact is that, that most mental illnesses are, are diseases of the brain, and we know that now, and this dichotomy has not been very helpful, but it still persists today. We have a department of mental health and a department of health, and, and that reflects this Cartesian dualism. Uh, John Locke was, of course, a very prominent uh, philosopher, 
and uh, he differentiated between uh, natural fools and insane persons. And today we would probably use uh, a, a term like developmental disabilities for what he called natural fools. And um, insane persons were, were people with mental illness who had uh, wrong ideas. We're going through very quickly and uh, covering lots of ground. But uh, Philippe Pinel uh, was a, a French psychiatrist. And he is famous for unchaining the patients at a psychiatric hospital called the Bicetra. And he, he came in, and uh, patients were chained to the walls. And, and there was concern that if they were unchained, they would do terrible things and, and uh, commit homicide and mayhem. And, and Pinel thought that was nonsense. And so he gave the order to unchain the patients. And of course, nothing bad happened. The patients were grateful for being treated humanely, and none of the anticipated consequences occurred. Um, William Tuke was a Quaker, and the Quakers uh, in the uh, 18th century became very concerned about the way that people with mental illness were being treated, and they really did take the, the lead in providing humane environments and what came to be called moral treatment. And, and these are some of the uh, 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 bulwarks of moral treatment. And uh, patients were expected to, to show restraint, show control. They were expected to socialize and, and re-socialize if they didn't have friends. Uh, the uh, idea of a harmonious environment was, was, was really critical to moral treatment, uh, a, a clean, healthy environment. Uh, people needed to be well-fed. Uh, they needed to have meaningful work to do. And, and staff were expected to be role models for uh, patients. And so uh, today, many of the ideas that we have in mental health can be traced back to moral treatment. Um, this is a wonderful movie. If you haven't seen it, it's called The Madness of King George. And uh, King George is, is often thought of as being mentally ill. He, uh, he probably had porphyria. And, uh, but he uh, was delusional, he had hallucinations. Uh, uh, eventually he, he died at the age of 72. But the Revolutionary War might have been very different had it not been for a series of bad decisions made by King George. And uh, it's, it's clear that, that oftentimes patients that were labeled as mentally ill had organic diseases. And uh, you remember in, in um, I think it's uh, Alice in Wonderland, uh, where there are references made to the Mad Hatter. And in fact, hatters became mad, people that made hats, because they used uh, mercury in working with the felt. And this constant exposure to mercury uh, damaged their brain, and they became uh, sometimes quite psychotic. And the idea of the Mad Hatter persists today. Um, in 1766, there was a psychiatrist named Tiso who uh, wrote a book on Onanism. And you might remember that Onan is the character in the Old Testament who wasted his seed. And there's a debate about whether or not this is a reference to masturbation or quietus interruptus. But uh, uh, Tiso was convinced that much of mental illness resulted from masturbation. And it, it seems ridiculous uh, today. But, but this had tremendous uh, influence in psychiatry. Benjamin Rush is the father of American psychiatry, and he certainly believed this. And I mentioned Dorothy Parker on the slide because uh, she had a parakeet that she named Onan because he wasted his seed. Uh, <laughs> um, the, um, this is from the Missouri State Archives, and it's a, uh, a record of, uh, from Fulton, I believe, uh, the State Lunatic Asylum. It doesn't specify which one. It was written in 1854, and it lists the probable causes of insanity. And I hope that, that our audience uh, outside of MIMH can read this OK. But it's interesting that eight of the patients were felt to be insane because of masturbation, and uh, 10 of the patients because of disappointed love. And um, I've had some experience with both and, and don't think they necessarily lead to, uh, to mental illness, but, uh, but maybe disappointed love. Uh, that was very painful. I don't know if you know the story about John Harvey Kellogg. Uh, 
but he was a physician who shared this concern about masturbation, and he thought that, uh, that eating meat uh, caused people to get stirred up and aroused and uh, took young people in a wrong direction. So he developed Kellogg's Corn Flakes as a nutritious, wholesome, bland food that would help keep young people on the straight and narrow. Um, we, we do have a, a history of, of chaining people to walls and using seclusion and restraint. And uh, this is a classic picture. The, the name of it is Dementia. But if you uh, visit uh, the basement level of this hospital or Fulton State Hospital, you, you can still see uh, manacles where people were chained to the wall. And in all fairness to the providers at the time, oftentimes there were no effective treatments and you had patients who were quite ill and had to be uh, restrained to protect themselves. But if you ever visit the Mental Health Association, which is now run by my friend David Shern and called Mental Health America, uh, you can see this bell in the lobby of the building. It's in Alexandria, Virginia. And what they did is they took these shackles from around the country from psychiatric hospitals and they melted them and then they forged this bell. And uh, cast in the shackles which bound them, this bell shall ring out hope for the mentally ill and victory over mental illness. And so if you find yourself in Washington, D.C. for any reason, you might want to go by and visit the Mental Health Association. Um, Benjamin Rush, again the father of American psychiatry uh, in the 19th century, uh, developed this tranquilizer chair and he thought that overstimulation resulted uh, in uh, uh, harming people with mental illness and got them agitated and the way to uh, uh, treat them was to reduce sensory overload. And I, I'm very proud of the fact that MIMH has been actively involved with working with the State Department of Mental Health. Uh, in a variety of programs to reduce seclusion and restraint in the state of Missouri. And uh, we've had federal funding for those programs and they really are successful. Just real briefly, uh, I should comment on phrenology because for a long time there was this belief uh, in the, uh, the early part of the 19th century that, that people's illness and, and certainly people's personality correlated with the bumps on their skull and that you could palpate somebody's skull and uh, figure out what their personality was like. And, and in retrospect, it seems very foolish because there's virtually no correlation between the shape of the skull and the underlying neural tissue. But uh, people believed in this, and you've, you've seen these models uh, like this. And, and even people as smart as Thomas Edison uh, bought into this and, and really believed that, uh, that his creativity and ingenuity came from the fact that he had a uh, particular shape to his skull. If you have a chance to visit uh, Akron, Ohio, you can go to the archives for the history of American psychology. And uh, most of us don't get to Akron very often, but it's worth the trip. I spent three days there as a visiting scholar and got uh, some, one of the graduate students to run this device and uh, print out my, uh, my personality based on the shape of the skull. And, and the interesting thing is it seems surprisingly accurate. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I think this was called the Barnum effect. It's kind of like horoscopes, and you read your horoscope, and it sounds like you. Um, physiognomy uh, was another uh, intellectual trend, and it, uh, this is an example of what the uh, criminal mind was supposed to look like. And it was the belief that, that, that physiognomy or your facial features predicted the kind of person you were likely to be and that's, that people with uh, certain facial features were likely to be criminals and other people with certain facial features were likely to be mentally ill. And nobody takes this seriously anymore and, uh, and certainly it has strong racist overtones. Um, throughout history, restraint devices have been used in the treatment of people with mental illness and most of these illustrations that I'm going to show you uh, come from the Glore Museum. Uh, here are a couple of illustrations. The Glore Museum is in St. Joseph, Joseph, Missouri. Um, it's, it's about a four-hour drive from here, and it is in a former psychiatric hospital. And the collection was put together by George Glore, a longtime employee of the Department of Mental Health. Uh, 
And if you have any reason to be in Kansas City or in the western part of the state, I strongly encourage you to go by and visit. It is a remarkable resource, and it's one that we should be very proud of. And, uh, and yet it also uh, underscores some things in our history that, that we're not very proud of. I think that uh, the MIMH CE team has spent some time develop working with uh, the Glory Museum and developing projects for them. And here you can see uh, boxes that were used to restrain patients. Um, here is uh, a collection from a patient who hoarded cigarette packs. And um, uh, this uh, is, uh, uh, reflects the contents, mainly nails, of a woman who was quite ill and, and ingested uh, nails and other metal objects. And it became clear that, that these had to be removed from her stomach. But unfortunately, when she was operated on, she died uh, on the operating table. So um, these are the kind of exhibits that you find at the Glory Museum. Uh, you also see uh, illustrations of straight jackets. Um, Joel Epstein and I uh, developed an exhibit for the St. Louis Science Center, and it's still up. And if you go there today, we have straight jackets on display and some other things that illustrate the history of mental illness. But um, it, the straight jacket is sort of a symbol of the way we have, have, have uh, restrained people who we feared. And we feared them because of their mental illness. Straight jackets aren't used today. Chemicals are used and drugs are used to restrain patients and to sedate patients. Uh, it's hard to talk about the history of mental illness without mentioning Dorothea Dix. She was a social worker who went around the country giving talks and uh, talking to state legislatures. She went to Jefferson City and addressed the, addressed the Missouri State Legislature and argued that people with mental illness needed humane treatments and they needed hospitals specifically for them. Uh, I'll just say a couple words about Freud because he certainly was uh, instrumental in the history of ideas, significant in the history of ideas, and uh, shaped some of the early treatment. <laughs> Freud speaking to you from the grave. Freud died in 1936, and uh, 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 Christina has had some psychoanalytic training, so I hope that's especially meaningful to you and, and interesting, Christina. And <clears throat> there, uh, there were, really were these two uh, major trends in, in psychiatry and to a lesser extent in psychology, and uh, one, uh, one group uh, went, went towards biology and neuroscience and uh, focused primarily on medications to treat people with mental illness. And, and other groups of psychiatrists and mental health professionals were influenced by Freud, that's his couch, and use uh, talk therapy and dynamic approaches to understand and treat people with mental illness. And there's an emerging literature that shows that, that really uh, combined treatments all, almost always work better than either medication used in isolation or therapy techniques used in isolation, and particularly cognitive behavior therapy techniques. Um, 
This is Fulton State Hospital. It's important in the history of mental health because it was the first psychiatric hospital built west of the Mississippi. And uh, there's a fascinating history. Um, the seventh governor of Missouri was uh, Tom Reynolds. And on February 9th, 1844, Governor Reynolds uh, went into his office in the executive mansion and uh, put a rifle in his mouth and committed suicide. And, and of course, this got the attention of the public. Uh, so far as I know, he's the only Missouri governor to have ever committed suicide. Uh, the lieutenant governor became the governor. He was somebody named Meredith uh, Maraduke. And when he addressed the General Assembly in Jefferson City, he called for the establishment of a psychiatric hospital for Missouri. Uh, and, and I'm sure the governor's suicide was a part of that. So it takes a big event of that type to trigger uh, the change that was needed, but uh, in part to pay homage to uh, somebody who really was a very popular governor. Uh, Fulton State Hospital was built, and of course uh, it is still operational today, and it really is a beautiful facility. I'm especially interested in the way that mental illness is portrayed in cinema, uh, and frequently lecture on this topic, and there are movies like The State Snake Pit and Chattahoochee uh, that, that present a very negative portrayal and probably a justified portrayal of how patients were treated in psychiatric hospitals. Chattahoochee is a real hospital in Florida, and uh, it's uh, actually, uh, there was a lawsuit and uh, dramatic changes occurred because of the courage of one of the patients. Here you see what um, uh, St. Louis uh, State Hospital used to look like, and it's what's called a Kirkbride Hospital. You almost always have the hospital built on a hill. Uh, you have a dome. Uh, oftentimes the superintendent and his family lived under the dome, and if there were children, uh, there was an attempt to pace, place the, the, the patients who were most sick furthest from the children. And uh, you can see how the symmetrical wings fan out. And uh, uh, these were called back wards. And today we use the term back wards to refer to uh, those places where the very sickest patients are treated. Um, oftentimes the hospitals were segregated and there would be another building off behind the main hospital where African American patients were treated. Uh, this is the former home of the Missouri Institute of Psychiatry. Uh, it's been turned down, but it was established by George Hewlett in 1962, and of course it eventually became um, the Missouri Institute of Mental Health. And here's a, uh, a picture of the hospital at night, and it really is a beautiful building, and it's, uh, all the wings have been torn down. At one time there were over 4,000 patients in this hospital, and now uh, MIMH occupies the second and third floor, and the Department of Mental Health has offices on the first and fourth floor, and uh, eventually we hope to turn this dome area into a museum similar to the Glore Museum. Uh, <clears throat> we are in a region called the Hill, and many people don't appreciate that, that the hospital, in fact, is on a hill. But if you go to Ted Drew's or you go out on Chippewa, you can see the hospital off in the distance, and it really is beautiful. And whenever I'm flying into St. Louis during the daytime, I always try to get an aisle seat so I can look for the dome, and, and most times I can spot it. Uh, the hill is best known as being the Little Italy part of St. Louis. Uh, when I took this job, I weighed about 150 pounds, and it's, it's fried ravioli that has done me in. Uh, this, uh, are there are a few shots here of the hospital and what it looks like, and there's a spiral staircase leading up to the dome, and it really is uh, fascinating. Uh, certainly a great deal of electroconvulsive therapy has uh, been performed at the hospital, and ECT is still being performed. It's a controversial procedure, but many of us who are clinicians feel that we have patients who would be dead today from suicide were it not for electroconvulsive therapy. Uh, part of the history of the treatment of mental illness in Missouri involves uh, lobotomies, and it is a, a fascinating part of the history. This is a guy named Walter Freeman who's doing what actually is called a leucotomy, in which uh, 
the, the skull itself is not penetrated, but the eye is pulled back and uh, a scalpel-like instrument is placed in the orbit uh, of the eye socket and then uh, moves back and forth and the, uh, the tracks from the frontal lobes to the rest of the brain are severed so you still have a frontal lobe, it just doesn't communicate with the rest of the brain. And uh, uh, people have compared this to, uh, uh, to doing surgery with a chainsaw. It, uh, it, it seems very primitive today, and uh, yet it was interesting for me to work with Leopold Hofstetter, who was a dear friend and a psychiatrist trained in Vienna, um, who uh, uh, had performed thousands of these operations and Leopold said, Danny, you have to understand, we were desperate to help our patients. We had people who had no hope, no future, and, and we thought that this treatment would make a difference. And, and we were wrong, but, but it was well-intentioned. And in, uh, Leopold uh, died a few years ago at the age of 96 and, and we miss him terribly. He was a great, great role model for all of us. Uh, Many people don't realize that, uh, that a, a neurologist named Moniz uh, from uh, Portugal actually got the Nobel Prize for developing this technology. And um, uh, that was in 1949. And, and I just wonder, a um, uh, hundred years from today, if, if much of what we're doing now in treating patients won't look equally primitive and equally crude and equally ineffective. Uh, this is a group of nurses from this hospital, and uh, of course there was a great deal of sexism uh, at the time, and, and the nurses all have starched white uniforms and white caps, and they had a uh, handbook, and this is a quotation from the handbook, and of course any nurse who smoked or used rouge, used liquor in any form, or had her hair done at a beauty parlor, or who frequented dance halls, or engaged in levity on Sunday would give the director of nursing good reason to suspect her worth, uh, intentions, and integrity. So it, it was a tough job, and uh, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't laugh very often, and you certainly couldn't uh, uh, have a drink now and then, and uh, there was no, uh, no picnics on Sunday. So we've come a long way, and, uh, and I take some pride in that. I've got some scenes from what the hospital was like at one time. I'll move through these quickly. But I want to give you a sense for the fact that there was a feeling of community. And in many ways, this hospital was self-contained. Uh, people grew their own crops. And, and remember, we had about 4,000 patients then, so we had lots of workers. They plowed their own fields. They did their own woodwork. Um, uh, labor was segregated. Women did washing, and, and men uh, picked up debris. Uh, this was an early pharmacy uh, shot, and, and by and large, these medications were placebos. Uh, they really, Thorazine was really the first effective treatment uh, in psychiatry, but many of the medications did uh, sedate patients. Uh, here you see uh, the beginnings of what eventually became the profession of occupational therapy, and these are women who are sewing. And uh, remember, this is part of moral treatment, this idea that you want to give some people something to do with their time. They need to be doing something meaningful and they need to be making a contribution. Uh, this is another scene from uh, St. Louis State Hospital and you see that the beds are in the hall and uh, throughout the history of, of mental health in America we, we have problems with overcrowding and we've always had that problem and continue to have it uh, today uh, but certainly up to the period of deinstitutionalization uh, here you see a person getting hydrotherapy, and it was thought that water was very instrumental in the treatment of people with mental illness. Uh, here's a patient getting a wet pack and is essentially uh, trying to sweat out his illness. Uh, these are early shots. This is uh, a drawing of St. Louis State Hospital. And then here is the hospital with uh, MIP in front of it. And uh, this was when uh, MIP had a, uh, uh, a tremendous research budget. And in fact, a lot of the early work in LSD was done in these buildings with patients before it became legal, illegal to, uh, to use uh, LSD in treating patients with mental illness. And the idea at the time 
in the early 60s when this building was built is that there was something shameful about the way patients had been treated in the old hospital and there was an effort to hide it. And, uh, and they took this beautiful old building and, and built in front of it uh, a building that was not nearly as aesthetically pleasing or as attractive. And uh, of course a few years ago that was torn down and the Missouri Institute of Mental Health uh, moved to the L building on the south side of the campus and then eventually to the, uh, the dome building. But that's what the hospital initially looked like when it was first built. And uh, it's interesting. This is an old photo that I got from the MIMH library. And you can see that there was a great deal of pollution. And remember that, that hospitals were built on hills because it was thought that, that patients with mental illness needed um, uh, clean air as part of their treatment. I've never been able to figure out exactly what this is, but I, as best I can tell, it's laundry that's been put out to dry uh, on the ground, and I assume it was grassy and relatively clean. Uh, this is what the St. Louis Psychiatric Rehabilitation Center looks like today. It is a modern, attractive facility, and I think those of us that live in Missouri can take considerable pride in the fact that we do have excellent hospitals and patients get uh, excellent care there. Uh, this is a scene from an Arsenal showing the hospital. Uh, this is a different hospital, and uh, there are now some tennis courts on the corner of uh, Arsenal and Sublet. And you've driven by those and you've seen those. What you might not know is that there used to be uh, another hospital there. And uh, it was called the St. Louis Hospital for Social Evils. And it was a women's hospital and they treated prostitutes who had venereal disease. Uh, it's interesting to go back and look at the records of the administrators of the two hospitals because they both complained about how difficult it was to keep our patients from fraternizing with their patients. Uh, but the hospital burned down in uh, 1888. Um, this is a slide I got from Jean Campbell and uh, it, it's snowing and you have to remember uh, to, to understand the history of this hospital that it was built during the Civil War and construction started in uh, 1863 and the first patients were brought here in 1869 but uh, that was a long time ago and it, it really is a beautiful hospital. Um, the, the community in in uh, the Hill area actually takes some pride in the hospital and uh, as there were discussions about tearing it down the community got together and they didn't want it torn down they thought it was a monument and it sort of uh, was part of the personality of the community. Uh, this is a book by my friend and former director of the Department of Mental Health Paul R that deals with the community mental health movement and of course when John F Kennedy was president he proposed that we deinstitutionalize patients, get patients out of the hospital, and treat them in community mental health centers. And Missouri played a critical role in the history of this community mental health center development. But of course, there never were sufficient community resources to meet the needs of the hundreds of thousands of patients who were discharged. And, and sadly, some of those patients are found today uh, in, in homeless shelters or living under bridges and they're not getting the treatment that they, uh, they should. Um, chloropromazine um, was developed in 1952. It came into widespread use in psychiatry about 1955. That's one of the reasons people stopped doing lobotomies uh, in the mid-50s is because effective treatments had been developed and this really was a wonder drug and changed the lives of patients dramatically. Um, and also it made a lot of money for the company that developed it. And so this is one of the challenges that we have today in mental health. We have effective new treatments, uh, treatments with fewer side effects, but oftentimes those new treatments are more costly than the old treatments. So as a society, we have to, to decide how much we're willing to invest in uh, treating people and trying to improve the quality of their life and how much we're willing to pay. Just briefly, uh, there's been a, a revolution in uh, imaging technology. Uh, I'm on the search committee for a uh, chair of the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Missouri. One of the candidates is an expert in neuroimaging.
and uh, we can we can see into the brain in a way we couldn't certainly when I was in graduate school and uh, some very exciting research is going on at places like Washington University in the Department of Psychiatry with with neuroimaging and uh, but we still oftentimes find that that morphologically the brains of people with mental illness look just like those of people without mental illness so it's not necessarily a structural problem that we're dealing with. But we have gotten past this idea of schizophrenogenic parents and um, we, we, we realize that ultimately when we talk about mental illnesses we're talking about brain diseases and, and uh, 30 years ago somebody with cancer would never admit they had cancer. There was a great deal of shame and stigma and naivete and people thought it might be contagious if you sat next to somebody with cancer and there was a tremendous amount of stigma associated with cancer and, and none of us believe we're going to catch cancer from somebody today and we're much more sophisticated and a lot of us go on on runs to raise money for cancer research and so my hope is that that increasingly we'll understand that we're talking about diseases of the brain and, and that brains can malfunction just like hearts and lungs and kidneys and livers. And uh, we will get away from this bifurcation and this mind-body split that has so bedeviled the field. Um, I will close with, uh, with a story that I like. It's a true story. It's about a, um, a patient of Fritz Dreyfus. And Fritz Dreyfus was at the University of Virginia and was probably the world's foremost epileptologist. And uh, he got patients from all over the country because of his expertise in epilepsy. And he got one patient who um, had a bona fide tonic-clonic seizure disorder, but she only seized when she heard Mahalia Jackson singing, My Heart Has a Life of Its Own. And she could listen to Mahalia Jackson singing anything else, and she wouldn't seize. And she could listen to anyone else singing, my heart has a life of its own, and she wouldn't seize. But every time she heard Mahalia Jackson singing, My Heart Has a Life of Its Own, she would go into a, 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 a EEG verified tonic clonic seizure. And one of the fascinating things for me about this story is that she was uh, uh, hospitalized as an inpatient for two weeks before a resident got around to asking her, by the way, is there anything special about Mahalia Jackson singing My Heart Has a Life of Its Own? And uh, she said, well, doctor, I don't know if it's important, but I guess you should know that that was the song they played at my mother's funeral as her casket was being lowered into the grave. And so psyche and soma are inextricably linked, and, and one can't suffer uh, without the other sympathizing. There are these connections. We don't fully understand them, but it is a, a great privilege for me to work at a place like the Missouri Institute of Mental Health where we're trying to come to understand these relationships. Uh, I think genomics will help us answer some of the questions out there, and certainly uh, neuroimaging will. So it's uh, the history of the people with, with uh, the history of the treatment of people with mental illness is, is really a fascinating history. Uh, if you're interested, I can recommend books that you might want to read, or we have a couple of websites I think listed that people might want to go to explore more information. And, uh, and I think that, that 30 years from now, that mental illness will be much like cancer. And uh, it won't have the stigma that it has today. And we're going to work really hard at MIMH to make sure that happens. Thank you. We encourage people online, if you have questions, to use the questions for speaker button that, that, that sends us uh, an email with, a que with your question in it. Are there questions in the room? Gene. I knew my friend Dr. <laughs> Campbell was, was going to ask a question. I well, or make a comment. I don't think this is on. It is. It doesn't go in the room. So oh, on. okay. Well, um, it was more a suggestion, yeah. Danny, and Please. then a question. The suggestion was that uh, you, I would suggest that you add another uh, section to your presentation. Um, particularly that brings us, you have one vision built upon the past, but there's another um, really important movement in mental health treatment today that is referred to as uh, 
in public policy is transformation. And it really deals with the, sl the split between biology and I would say subjectivity. Mm -hmm. So that um, looking at the person as a whole in terms of treatment as opposed to the neuro image or the lung or sure. the liver. And um, I'd like you to comment on that and maybe our work at MIMH in okay. terms of what I would think is another important error that could be complementary to the biomedical approach, but certainly wasn't in this presentation addressed. Yeah, I, I think this idea of integrated care, which is part of the transformation movement that Gene's talking about, is tremendously exciting. And uh, actually, Missouri is one of the leading states in this effort. And uh, we received a very large transformation grant to support these efforts. And uh, places like the Kreider Center for Mental Health uh, that have traditionally treated people with mental illness are realizing that a lot of their patients have uh, medical problems as well. And uh, we know that people with, with mental illness die about 25 to 30 years earlier than people without mental illness. But it's not because of suicide or schizophrenia or depression. They die from, from diabetes. And these are very complicated relationships. Oftentimes, the medications that are used to treat a disease like schizophrenia uh, have this, this terrible side effect of weight gain. And people who gain weight uh, become diabetic. They become hypertensive. And, and that is what kills them. And uh, at places like the Kreider Center, what you're doing is, is you're co-locating services. So you have primary care physicians and mental health professionals working side by side in the same site and, and uh, taking uh, classes like this together, getting continuing education together. And so effectively what we're doing is getting away from that mind-body split that Descartes caused uh, hundreds of years ago. And we're moving back to realizing that we have to treat whole people. And uh, we, there is very good evidence that if a primary care provider refers a patient to a mental health professional, there's about a 20% likelihood that the patient will show up and get treatment. But if uh, mental health services and physical health services are being developed, at the, uh, being offered at the same site, and a physician will walk down the hall and introduce a patient, to a mental health provider, there's about an 80, 85 percent chance that the patient will follow up and come back for treatment. And so I think that's part of it, Gene, and uh, I'm really excited by that, and I'm excited that Missouri's taking the lead in that area. Thank you for your time. Danny, thanks for your expertise.